Welcome, everybody. It is so great to be with you here. And let's get to this really important topic, which is super interesting. And certainly it's been a topic of conversation around, uh, let's say, if you want to consider it social media or whatever it is. Um, it certainly has been uh, a whirlwind in terms of, you know, how do we practice? I mean, is it evidence-based? Is it clinical opinion? You see both things. And, and by the way, this is a really, really old uh, conversation and question. And this is not something. It just seems like the injector community is a little bit more up in arms uh, over this. And uh, maybe because it's just we're a younger community in terms of a field. Uh, but this is really something that we'll be able to talk through. But we're going to show a lot of video and we're going to show you, uh, you know, some treatment video, some other uh some video that um, will show you some evidence-based and let's go ahead and see what's missing and see how do we evaluate evidence-based. We are really a clinician. How do we value clinical opinion? Who's right, who's wrong? Is there a right or wrong? And probably not. So let's get into this. But we will show you some really interesting There will all, a video. There will also be anatomy dissections in here. So uh, be forewarned and so you know what is coming. But let's get to this. And my name is Dr. Louis Maltzmacher, and I am president of the American Academy of Facial Aesthetics. And you can go ahead and take a look. This is just some resources. I'll touch on some of these topics there as well as they go ahead and fit in to what we are going to talk about. But there's my email if you want to contact me. And certainly you can contact uh, the American Academy of Facial Aesthetics at, at facialaesthetics.org on uh, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. Uh, and uh, by email there as well. And there are a bunch of reference websites, uh, AV training, because there are always a lot of questions about training. So if you're interested, you can go there, AV virtual. We've got virtual CME training, AV ultrasound, stat TDS. Uh, we will talk about, we're going to be very product specific because some of the evidence-based studies that talk about some of the things that we're going to discuss are uh, are also kind of specific in terms of products and that is going to go ahead and kind of uh, give you a different view of what is out there but we'll show you a little bit of everything uh, with some PDO threads and uh, wave aesthetics on afewebinars.com those are all references for you if you want to go there but let's get to this topic how do we make clinical decisions in the a facial aesthetic arena which is really in any arena whether it is uh, medical, dental, nursing, any of the, these things. These are the three things that we need to balance. And I will tell you, there's lots of evidence based, especially now. And I, I talk to, I tell this to everybody. In terms of injectables right now, it, it, medical aesthetics, facial aesthetic dentistry are very deep fields. They're dynamic fields. There's a ton of research going out. So there's a lot of evidence that is coming out. How do we as a clinician balance the evidence versus or with our clinical experience and what is the one thing that i really think is missing a lot uh in the uh, injectable world is the bottom one critical thinking now in any of your treatment decisions one of these things may be important more important than the other things but we've got to add critical thinking you can't just take either clinical experience or evidence-based uh, evidence-based studies at face value because you've got to look at this and every good evidence-based study by the way uh it will tell you the limitations the methods and uh and what may be holding this study back and and, and many evidence-based studies will also tell you this needs further study so you can take things at face value and again i'm the word this is not about criticizing this is having about open honest discussion i will say this as well Many people, we, we like to put people into boxes, right? And certainly, again, you see this played out, uh, especially, you know, on social media where people, you know, can be very vocal and tend to take sides. You know, unfortunately, it may be just a reflection uh, in the, of the world we live in right now. And a lot of people think someone is evidence-based you know what, they don't know anything about the real clinical world or they never touch a patient. And so what could they possibly know? Then you think people, someone with clinical experience that may express an opinion, well, they're not basing anything on the evidence. They're only basing it on their own opinion. They're, they're both wrong, okay? The people that are in the evidence-based world, many of them are clinicians or deal with patients or really know how to how these things work with patients. 
clinical experience, they're, they're not in a box of just clinical experience. Of course they look at studies. They may look at studies that will go ahead and balance or contradict other studies. So, you know, it really, the bottom line is critical thinking. You need to critically think about what these things are. So, you know, it, it's, and it's not about picking apart some studies. We're gonna show you some evidence-based studies and it's not, about, it's, it's not about picking them apart. It's about thinking them through and what really lies ahead. And you are free to disagree with whatever I say. You're also free to agree with uh, some of the points I'm going to make here. But as long as I can get you to critical thinking Right, and think of through this by yourself, and don't accept things at just face value. If the, if the person, if the person delivering it, clinical opinion or experience or evidence base can be the world's expert. You still have to make the final treatment decision for you and your patients, and what is right. So let's start with our first one here, and uh, this is one about arterial wall penetration forces in needles versus cannulas, and they're all great studies. But let's, get, again, critically take a look at this. And, you know, many of the researchers, certainly the one most well-known, Sebastian Cotofana, MD, PhD. We have the pleasure of having Professor Cotofana at our AAFE Aesthetic Vision. And uh, he is just a world-class researcher, world-class uh, in terms of anatomist. I mean, they are really one of a kind when it came, comes to anatomy. He did cadaver dissections while myself and one of our other faculty members, Dr. David Kimmel, uh, did actual injections related it back and forth. I'm just really, uh, just amazing, amazing, amazing. But let's take a look at this study, which is, uh, which all of a sudden became the study that, you know, selling everybody, you know, everybody relies on this. And it is about, you know, forget about using small cannulas like a 27, 30 gauge, they're as sharp as a needle and uh, you should only be using 25 gauge and above. Well, is that really true when you go ahead and take a look at study? So my clinical experience, for example, and not just mine, but the clinical experience of many, many people uh, for the last 13, 14 years that we've been doing this, we, we use 27 and 30 gauge cannulas all the time, right? And we did not experience people getting blind or vascular occlusions or that kind of thing on any great level or anything else like that. Um, I mean, not, uh, certainly not anything more than, I mean, I don't, I don't remember ever having a vascular occlusion uh, using a cannula, uh, a small cannula like this. So like, how do we balance that clinical experience with this? Well, let's look at this study. And is this what this study is really going ahead and saying? So in this study, by the way, I mean, they, they tested a number of cannulas and you can take a look at the particulars of this study by, by itself. But to me, one of the, I mean, it, it, it certainly shows that a 27 and 30 gauge cannula will, can be as sharp as a needle, but that's only true of one manufacturer that they studied. They only studied one manufacturer. Um, I won't say the name. The name is, does not appear in the study, which is unusual because typically uh, the products that are used uh, in these studies are identified by manufacturer. And, um, you know, so does that relate? There are a lot of different microcannulas on the market made by numerous manufacturers. If this assumes that all, all of the, again, let me put it this way. The people that make the assumption that this study says that all 27 and 30 gauge microcannulas are as sharp as a needle, well, based on this study, they didn't test all of them. They tested one manufacturer and they're all different the way they're manufactured. And that is a real fact for that. So you can't extrapolate from this study that all 27 and 30 gauge microcannulas are bad. Now, some of you are trained in microcannulas, some of you are not. Uh, some of you have trained and you've hated the microcannula because maybe it wasn't a particularly good one or you just didn't like it. Certainly cannula is a tool, just like a needle is a tool for delivering filler for that. But let's take a look. And why not do some critical thinking? And why not test it out for yourself? For example, um, let's go ahead. Now we in the AAFE, when we go ahead, and I told you I'm going to be very product specific in, in different things. This, the, we use something called the Comfortac microcannula. It was not the one that was tested in this study. There's a 30 gauge needle, which is actually uh, Comfortox uh, brand needle. There is a Comfortox microcannula. Now you can see for yourself how blunt it is. Well, let's do our own little test. We're actually gonna do two tests on this uh, as well. And again, why, why not go ahead and do your own kind of testing there, right? 
So let's um, just play a little video to kind of test this. If that 30 gauge micro cannula is as sharp as the needle, right? Well, then it should act like a needle, right? Well, let's see if it does. Here we go. We're going to go ahead and do our own little experiment here to see, is it true if a very small cannula, micro cannula, is as sharp as a needle? So here we have a Comfortox syringe with a 31 gauge needle. Here we have a 27 gauge needle, the kinds that you use all the time for Botox and filler injections. And here we have Comfortox micro cannulas, a 25 gauge, a 27 gauge, and a 30 gauge and so let's go ahead and see so let's go with comfortox micro cannulas first and see is it as sharp as a needle here so i'm just going to use i'm going to sacrifice my finger for the betterment of society here so this is a 25 gauge and let me tell you that i'm going to show you that i'm pushing pretty hard you can see i'm indenting the skin and it's definitely not going through so that's the 20 five gauge comfort tox micro cannula you can see the little dent that it made right in my finger here so let's take a look 27 gauge it's been uh, reported that a 27 gauge micro cannula is as sharp as a needle here so let's go ahead and try that so i'll just gotta try to do this in front of the camera here where you can see it here we go we're going to push it in and see we're really pushing hard you can see it indenting the skin and i am not getting any piercing through and you can see these are fairly blunt comfort tox micro cannulas they're the best ones and they're definitely the smoothest and the bluntest and this is why they don't do it now let's go to a 30 gauge is a 30 gauge going to go ahead and pierce through my skin so you can see i'll go a little bit uh somewhere a little bit to a different spot and pushing fairly hard and denting the skin and you can see none of them are going to puncture through the skin i'll push it so you can see that there is no blood coming out or anything like that so is it true now let's take this 27 gauge needle and push this into the skin and see if we're going to, going to get anything no are you crazy i'm not going to go ahead and do that you know it you can see the bevel on that and same thing with a 30 gauge so is it true that these micro cannulas are as uh, sharp as a needle? Absolutely not. And But this is only true about the Comfortox micro cannula. Other micro cannulas are made with different technology, and that is... Uh, that is the problem is that some of them can actually pierce through so you've got to know not all micro cannulas are created equal and what we've done here in our little experiment is to show you that a comfort tox micro cannula is among the bluntest micro cannulas out there and safe for trying to pierce through skin but especially safe for use uh, and we don't really have to worry as much about getting into a vessel but like always we do everything according to the AFE safe injection perfection technique even with a micro cannula so that's not good enough I mean I mean that that's a nice little test to do to do on yourself for that but for us in the AV that's not good enough we went into we have uh, routinely uh, our own cadaver labs and we do our own cadaver lab research so the, uh, here comes a, a cadaver dissection taken from one of the AFI cadaver labs where we were also testing this theory. Now, again, realize that uh, it's it's hard to pierce a vessel uh, with a micro cannula, at least a Comfortox micro cannula, even when you can see what you're doing. So imagine how much tougher it is when you can't see what you're doing, which would be normal uh, normal filler conditions in a living human being. But Cadaver dissection coming. Get anybody out of the room that you don't want to be seeing this. Here we go. And you'll see another little test. Here. Now, let's go ahead and show you. You hear that a very small cannula, 30-gauge cannula, can go ahead and pierce a vessel. Well, we decided, we, you know, again, we'll, we're all for the science, but now let's see if it's really true in our own hands. This is a 30-gauge Comfortox cannula. Now, the Comfortox micro cannula is made much differently. It's got a much blunter end, and it has got the right flexibility. As you can see, I can try as hard as I want. I, and this is the su superficial temporal artery, and I cannot cannulate this with the Comfortox micro cannula. I can't talk about other micro cannulas because they're not as blunt. This is the bluntest cannula on the market, even though it's a 30 gauge, 
it is entirely safe. And here's when I can see the vessel, and I'm trying to cannulate it, and you can see uh, one of our nurse injectors is a little frustrated trying to get into it, and she she has been an ER nurse for many years, and those of you who know, those are the, they, they can get into any vessel with just about anything, but here she even stabilizes the vessel, Comfortox microcannula, even a 30 gauge. This is to us, the safest one on the market, and that's why it's exclusively what we use in the AAFE. So the science says stay away from these things. We don't because if you use the right tool, and this was not part of the study uh, where they found that the small cannulas go ahead and will cannulate a vessel. She's trying to go from a 90 degree angle. She cannot puncture this vessel. Now imagine it's surrounded by tissue. Imagine when you can't see it, the chances are uh, I mean, minuscule that you would even get into this uh, vessel, especially when you get with a cannula here. But now what we're going to do is let's go ahead and take a needle. And this should be a fairly simple procedure. Again, we're going back with our uh, just a sharp needle, and this is a 27-gauge needle, and if you can see it, certainly you can easily cannulate it and see what happens when you are literally inside a vessel and you start to go ahead and deliver some. She's going to take a couple of stabs by at this, uh, pun intended, by the way, as you can see. But here, it stab stabilize it, easily glide right into the vessel, and can inject it. Imagine if this happens to you. This is why you must aspirate. Here you would, in a live patient, get a real uh, positive aspiration without a doubt, and then you've got to keep the needle moving. Obviously, positive aspiration, you are going to uh, pull it out and redirect, but make sure that you redirect in a different plane so that you are not in the same plane as the vessel where you may have gotten a positive aspiration. That's, that would be a complete arterial occlusion blockage. And this is what AFI research is all about, so get AFI certification trained today. And that is, that's where you can get it. You can get it at statds.com. To us, it is the best microcannula on the market because it's not, most of them are too flexible. This has got the right flexibility and is definitely easier to use and will glide through the tissue, will not dive on you deep. You've always got to know where the tip of your cannula or needle is. That's one of the rules of injecting, and it comes in all the popular sizes, including small sizes. Now, is it a crime to use small sizes? No, nope. let me show you on the live patient what it's like to use a small size cannula here. The other side, and then we're going to go backwards here. So right around here, I'm going to go ahead, and you may feel a little pinch, and you should, I told her, I tell mm -hmm. people, let me know if you feel anything because um, we can always give more anesthesia if they need it, but she's tough, Nicole, and mm -hmm. she does just great. Now, what we do is we just move this back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You can go ahead and stabilize the tissue to give you a little bit more, uh, you know, ability to go ahead and uh, form that pilot hole right here. This is a 25 gauge. Again, I'm going to use a 30 gauge. You can certainly use a 30 gauge, 27 gauge, 25 gauge, and any of these, but with these uh, micro cannulas by Comfort you can certainly uh, do very well with a 30 gauge because it is not as flexible, which is what we want. And that's, you know, while, while all the other micro cannulas are talking about how flexible they are, that works against you. This has got the right flexibility to really do the job for you very nicely here. So that's my pilot hole. Little bit of bleeding is actually a good thing because it's hard to identify these pilot holes sometimes uh, for this. So this is, again, I'm going to use Velour and this is a 30 gauge Comfort Docs micro cannula that we are going to go ahead and place right in that pilot hole, as you can see right there. And that's, this is the hardest part of the procedure. And we're gonna hold the, the tissue a little bit see where I've got that, slip right in there. So that was fairly easy. Again, it, because it's a 30 gauge, that's pretty easy. Now, as we were talking to the patient, uh, you know, the only thing different between this and the needle from the patient's point of view is you do tend to hear a few more pops here. So the way to go ahead and use a micro cannula that's a little bit more comfortable and a little bit more efficient is to go ahead and I'm not going to force anything because as you see, I'm pushing on this right now and it's kind of, you know, it's got to push itself through the tissue here, but it's much easier to imagine this is a curtain and the tissue is a curtain rod and I'm going to pull the curtain rod over 
the micro cannula and that does the job much better for the patient here. Now again, here you can go ahead and see, I can tent this up and you can actually see the tenting up. This 30 gauge is fairly stiff, which is what I want. So I know exactly where the end of my micro cannula is at any time. I'm going to go ahead and still going to aspirate. You always want to practice safe injection technique. And again, this is Velour that we're using. She's had this before very successfully. And I'm going to give her a very, very slow retrograde injection here of Velour. And that's also going to help with anesthesia once we get some of that in. You can see it there. All right. Now, uh, so let's just finish up on the micro cannula. So is that study wrong? No, the study is right. But that study, again, in my mind and the way that, uh, that I'm looking at this for evaluating it from my own clinical experience, that study is correct but it's very specific to one brand of cannula which is not named in the study. I asked Professor Cordofana and I'll, if you want to know, I'll let him share it with you if you'd like to know, but it does not apply to all micro cannulas, but somehow, and again, this, this is some of the danger of just putting things into boxes. Somehow that became like, this is gospel. I mean, this is literally uh, sent from heaven that it is an absolute crime to use a small gauge cannula because you might get a vascular occlusion. It's not true, at least from our clinical experience and what we see in the evidence. And uh, you put it all together with some critical thinking. But again, you may have another opinion and that's fine. We don't need to put people in the boxes. We can certainly agree to disagree uh, for that. So again, it's not right or wrong. It's how you evaluate everything. Here is an excellent evidence-based article, again, uh, with uh, all of these people, all wonderful researchers, and, uh, and Sebastian Codafana, again, who is most of the time, many times, is the corresponding author for all of these things. The Layered Anatomy of the Nose, an ultrasound-based investigation. Fantastic article. You should see it. I mean, they do come out. That soft tissue filler administration in the nose carries the highest risk for irreversible vision loss compared with any other facial region. Um, and, the, and it talks about different layers of the nose, different anatomy layers, and the use of ultrasound. So that is great. Not that it's necessarily new information. Uh, certainly any injector has been warned a thousand times that the nose potentially you know, can, uh, can, even though it's very rare, let's, let's be honest about this, it certainly can happen. It's very rare to go ahead and have irreversible vision loss. It is a, not a common complication, but something you darn well better be trained for and ready for if you ever treat the nose. And the AFE's got a master nose course, and, and certainly it's for more advanced injectors. Um, and it's more about knowing how to, how to prevent and, and deal with complications. And ultrasound is fantastic. And I am so glad that they gave, uh, they're starting to use ultrasound in some of their research because it is so fantastic and it's something to have. So it just gives us a quick chance talk about ultrasound there just a little bit and this is one of our patients um, in the AP training center and we use her in our master nose course as well uh, to demonstrate the procedure step by step carefully carefully lift up that tip straighten out the dorsal hump there and uh, again do a little bit with the halo of the nose many different things you can do with Botox fillers and PDO threads when it comes to uh, doing very safe non-surgical nose jobs or, or you know no nasal enhancements for that it's really hard to be an advanced injector and say I don't treat the nose because you know you would say we say we treat total facial aesthetics but not not that thing right in the middle of your face with which really determines a lot of facial aesthetics uh, learn how to do it, but learn it if you are, are advanced, if you've got the right tools, if you've got the right experience, and you've got the right technique, and you know how to prevent complications here. But let me just give you my quickest little uh, introduction to ultrasound, and I am thrilled that they are using it uh, in research and evidence-based studies. And I think, I personally think that every single injection should get one there have been some roadblocks and and we finally there's been some advancements in terms of all of this where would you use an ultrasound quick anatomy mapping one minute or less i need a if i'm a clinician i know what i need i want something for quick anatomy mapping if i have a question about the anatomy in front of me or i always want to check a nose i always want to check a piriform fossa a uh, a, a temple 
deficiency. Uh, I want to check the anatomy there, jawline, other things. I want something quick and easy to use that I can put on there, get the image, get the information that I want, and and just go on, right? And complications management. Is it a bruise? Is it a vascular event? Now you can tell with an ultrasound. Uh, again, this is this is going to be the shortest little ultrasound introduction you've ever had. But these things you can. You can dissolve all the filler. And now you can go pinpoint the lens De Lorenzo protocol. No need for that. Again, another thing that maybe we need to rethink a little bit because there's nothing else that we have. If you're familiar with the De Lorenzo protocol for using hyaluronidase, it's pretty much a shot cone uh, fire hose approach where let's just dump as much as we can into that area. You don't need to do that, especially with an ultrasound, and I'm not sure that's the safest thing to do anyway, is dump a ton of hyaluronidase in there. You want to be much more specific. Safety and aesthetic outcomes, it's great. This is just, let me give you the quickest little, uh, the quickest little introduction to ultrasound. That's the temporal area, and that you see in this, in this, you see amazingly many of Professor Cotafana's uh, different, you know, I don't know if he's up to 10, 15, 20 different layers of the temporal area, but certainly he's, he's discovered many of them, and it's fascinating to see this, and this is that. Now, you may not know what you're looking at of any clue. I mean, what you're looking at really with ultrasound is a radiograph of the soft tissue. Look, think of it that way. But if I start to orient you a little bit, with the top, the top here is uh, the skin surface. This here right here is bone. Well, now you know. Well, when you think about your anatomy, you know your temporalis is going to be around here. And you're going to start th seeing some of the other white lines here are the deep, are the superficial temporal fascia, the deep temporal fascia, all of those kinds of things. This little thing up here, as it runs through some of this, is the superficial temporal artery. Now you start to see some of these things. And then you start to really define this as on your own and really be able to start to understand what is it that we are looking at uh, what is it that we're looking at? And you start to identify all of these different layers of the temporal area. But once you know where the top is, the skin, once you know where the bottom is, and once you know which is left to right and left is usually either your cranial or lateral, then it starts to make sense. But it just takes time to get used to the images. And certainly some certification training uh, doesn't hurt as well here. But here's where an ultrasound will really shine. Is this a bruise or is this a vascular event? Many times you just don't know at the time. And many of a clinician, many of an injector has thought that this is what? This is a, uh, this, oh, it must be a bruise. And let, let the patient go home. And then, you know, a few days later, half their lip starts to fall off. And you think, well, maybe that wasn't a bruise. You don't have to guess. Now you can know uh, with an ultrasound because you can see right away, where's your filler? Where's the uh, the superior uh, the superior label of artery? Um, is it blocking it? You can see all those things on an ultrasound. And then you dissolve it. You can see if all the filler is gone. And that's really what's great about it. And then you discover interesting little things like this. What the heck do you think this is in the tissue? You know, I won't have to have you write it down, but think in your mind, what could that be? Well, let's take a look at uh, a little bit of an ultrasound examination we did on this patient uh, and you will see her. Here we go with a masseter and a facial artery and vein examination. But look at this, what we found as we we're going back to the corner of the jaw. What is that visual that you see right there? That is actually a metal staple that this patient had because she had orthognathic surgery, a class three mandible that really jutted out. They kind of sliced the bone, moved the whole thing back, and then they staple it up and it will come out on an ultrasound. So the ultrasound can pick up some very interesting things. You need to know the patient's history for sure. And that is really about the corner of the jaw. And as we're going to go ahead and move forward, you can see that's kind of covered by parts of the of the masseter muscle there, and that is between the white line on the bottom, which is bone, and the uh, SMAS layer, which is the white line. That's where you see the masseter muscle here. But now let's go ahead and take a look as we search for the facial artery and facial vein as they come in right there, and you see that's the masseter, and that's when the patient's biting down, and it's contracted. Now we're going to take a look. See that little round circle there, and that is what you can see in the B mode 
without the color Doppler, you can start to see where it starts to come in, and that is the facial vein, facial artery, which is which. We're going to show you how to tell the difference in just a minute here when you're doing an examination. Remember, you're putting light pressure on the tissue. Now you put the color Doppler on with the Wave FE, and you start to see those really start to light up. And remember, with color Doppler, red and blue does not mean artery and vein. Now let's take a look. How do we know if it's a vein or an artery? Sometimes you'll see the pulsation, but we're going to put some pressure on that area, and you will see the vein disappear. We'll do that again. Vein disappear, and that is how you tell it. Veins collapse with pressure, and arteries do not. So that's how you tell the difference between an artery and vein, and that's a beautiful sampling of what the facial artery and facial vein look like right in front of the masseter as it comes into the rest of the face. And I really believe everyone should be getting an ultrasound. And to, from the AFE's point of view, we are so excited that Wave Aesthetics here, and I don't, uh, this, I, I have full disclosure, I don't make a penny off of any of this. I have no relationship to Wave Aesthetics or anything like that. But I sure am happy that there is finally an affordable uh, handheld color lineal ultrasound that, again, with the help of the AFE and the AFE faculty, that we optimize the settings for facial aesthetics in an easy-to-use unit. This is thousands of dollars less than anything else on the market, and certainly the other ones on the market are the Clarius, which many of you know, V-Scan Air, there's a Butterfly, and there are a few others. Some are corded, some are cordless. This is a cordless, but this is made for heavy-duty lifting, too, but it's made for that quick precision analysis me mapping the all everything you've seen uh, that we presented all came from the wave fe and it is literally thousands of dollars less than anything else right now and you can see what's available there you can go to waveaesthetics.com it's stable it's direct it doesn't have a heavy duty battery pack because it doesn't need it this is more like a tesla where it's got an integrated battery that will last a long part of the day and comes with wireless chargers you don't have to worry about that uh, doesn't overheat doesn't shut down Easy to use software, and the nicest thing about this is that it stores right on your iPad or iPhone and Android device, and that makes it super easy. There's not any kind of a cloud situation that you have to upload uh, to. I mean, it is readily available, and you can use it every all of these images immediately uh, for that, and it just goes straight to there, so you don't have to think about it for that. You can, there's, there is a fee certification training. It's got some functions that you would pay extra for with other, uh, with other ultrasound devices. Um, and again, it's, you can't beat that price for a wireless uh, cordless ultrasound that is absolutely fantastic. We use it in AFE trainings because we want everyone to have an ultrasound. And now, finally, it's affordable really for every clinician to get it. And I think it's an invaluable tool. And I think that's what the evidence-based studies are now showing because they're using it. And I think that is a great situation for any, any clinician, any injector that wants to really be the safest injector possible. So definitely look into ultrasound, look at all the different devices, compare uh, all you want. But again, most of what you're going to use it for is quick anatomy mapping and complications management. For that, you, de you decide what level you want to spend on an ultrasound. But we absolutely love this device. We use it in our AFI training centers where we see patients every single day because uh, it's quick and easy. So take a look at ultrasound. It's here to stay now in facial aesthetics and injectables. Um, and I think think it's going to become pretty essential too for that. Let's take a look at one more study and take a look. Here are all the available dermal fillers currently on the U.S. market that are FDA cleared. But let's look at this study. And again, just critical thinking. And the study, to me, evidence-based, when it's a well-done study, it's always right. The question is, how does it apply to your uh you know to your practice as a clinician and, and what do you take out of this study and this is a quantitative analysis of the lifting effect of facial soft tissue filler injections where they took a number of uh of cadaver uh cadavers they did a really smart thing is that they went ahead and uh you know put them upright so that the cadaver heads would simu simulate you know a, a patient that is pretty much upright and gravity pulls things down and then quantitatively quantitatively analyzed uh, putting some filler in different parts of the face as you can see and you can go read the entire study yourself uh, for that and does 
dermal fillers, hyaluronic acid dermal fillers, actually have a lifting effect. And the conclusion of this is that it provides evidence that, I'm reading it, soft tissue fillers, although typically classified as volumizers, can induce lifting effects on the face. So that sounds great, but how much lifting effect? And if you take a look right there, uh, that's the biggest number uh, here. It had a 1.11 millimeter lifting effect. And again, you can read the, it, uh, all the different numbers here and where on the, uh, on the surface and where on the cadaver head they were injected. Give you, But that's the biggest number. Now, the question is, yes, technically that is absolutely true. And this evidence-based study is wonderful and proved it. Um, but is 1.11 millimeters signi clinically significant? Would your patient be happy if I said, you know what, if I, or my patient, if I said to my patient, um, I've got, I'm going to give you some fillers and you're going to get this lift, right? Well, they're expecting a lift. They are not expecting 1.11 millimeters. So while technically true, is it clinically relevant for most patients? Are they going to see some kind of a result? That's not a question for me to answer. It's a question for you to answer. And what do you think uh, for that? So again, that's how you balance this. But, you know, uh, uh, unfortunately, again, and, and I'll tell you, this is really, I think, where, where just people are getting a little it's getting a little out of hand is where, you know, if if someone questions this study or another study or any other studies uh, that come out from excellent researchers like this, and I mean, I saw this recently online uh, on one of these posts where, you know, how dare you, along the lines of how dare you, uh, you know, criticize or question true evidence-based studies. Well, that's our job. I mean, that's our job as clinicians, and that's critical thinking. And it's not, again, it's not a negative these are all great studies that give us information. Now, how do we synthesize that information for what we're going to do? To me, and again, do they lift? According to the study, they do. Do they really lift clinically? I'm not promising a patient, but if you really want to lift, let's talk lifting, and that is going to be uh, lifting PDO threads. And I'm going to show you a little bit of this patient's treatment when it comes to lifting PDO threads. This is a real physical lift, and as you can see, this is before and after that's about a week later minimal healing that she did uh, on this here but that's a lot more than one millimeters right and this is you're attaching these lifting PDO threads in this case it was VSOF lift which is what we use exclusively in AAFE training why it's the strongest and the best and it's uh, it's got the best FDA class 2 clearance uh, again in our opinion I'll show you some others uh, too, but it's a minimum amount of threads for maximum results, and it's going to be a lot more than 1.11 millimeters. This is a real physical lift. So while dermal fillers, according to the study, may lift, well, you might want to start taking a look at this. And there's plenty of studies with uh, PDO threads, lifting and smooth PDO threads. My, this is my usual warning for this. And again, let me preface this by saying this is my opinion and you can do with it what you want, but it's also your license that's at risk. So you better think this through. For, for us, we have, this is what we want out of these things because unfortunately, you all know not to buy fake Botox and fake fillers. I think that goes without saying. You would never use uh, a filler that came out of the box that didn't have some kind of printing on the package, not a little sticker that got stuck to it, printing or any kind of a blank packaging. You would never use that, right? I hope you wouldn't use that. It's your license at risk for that. So our, our opinion, and for, for and again, we train a lot of injectors and we've got to make sure that they they their licenses are protected here. Um, again, this is our opinion. You may have a different opinion and that's fine. FDA cleared class two, 510K. This is the, the nerdy FDA stuff. I don't expect you all to understand what that is. That is essential that you absolutely need this with proper packaging to identify the name on the package like this. Okay, that's the proper packaging I'm looking for so that I know that this is the real product that's supposed to be with the FDA clearance. I personally, opinion, I would never use a blank package like this. It's got a little sticker on there, at least to tell you the gauge and the size. I'm not putting my license at risk for that. So you can see, the, for, and there are about 20 companies, I don't even have them all on here, in the U.S. right now, 
but there are only three that would meet that requirement, the, at least that we found. And I, I, I always open this up. Please email me if you know of others that will meet these requirements, and we will certainly add them to the list and uh, that, and, uh, and and adjust this. But VSoft, Lyft, Nova Threads, and Mint will have what we consider uh, necessary to use on patients and that fulfill all of our requirements. FDA cleared class two with a 510K and proper packaging. You see some of the other ones. I'm not saying they work or they don't work. The question is, it's your, you're, you're going to go ahead and make that choice. Um, and you know that and I'll tell you, if you have a patient complaint, they're going to be looking closely at the products. The FDA listed class one, I mean, the, the, everything except for the top three, for us, our recommendations and our opinion are not recommended. FDA listed class one is nothing. It means they paid the FDA uh, to, to list their products and anybody can do that. I don't care if they have got, uh, you know, big name plastic surgeons or, or dermatologists or, or nurse practitioners or PAs or dentists on their board or as medical directors. That doesn't make a difference to you and your license. It really doesn't because these companies won't be there to back you up. Uh, if you ever get into trouble. And again, if I've, uh, I I welcome any feedback from anybody that's got different information, I'm happy to update this. Uh, but this is the most recent information that we have right here. But let me show you what this looks like. Why do we pick VSoft Lift? Very simply, it is the strongest. Why, why is it the strongest? Well, if you take a look at some of the other uh, some of the other PDO threads, take a look at the number of threads that they use and recommend to get a great lift. VSoft Lift is going to be a lot less, which means what's the reason they need more of the other companies? Because they're not as strong. VSoft Lift, take a look and see what we do on this patient. We're going to come into the middle of the procedure where we're ready, ready to do the jawline lift here. And again, fillers lift. This really lifts. Let me show you a little bit of the procedure on this patient that you just saw the before and after. Literally, we'll hear a click, 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 and now that jawline has been snatched back and pulled back really, really nicely here, and that is, look at the strength on that thread. You can't do this with many other PDO threads, and that's the reason that we use uh, the VSoft Lift brand of PDO threads here. So now let's go ahead and place another thread. That's going to snatch the jawline back, start there, and now we're going to go ahead and place one from around the zygoma and direct it to the oral commissure and to the jowl area there as well. Same thing, we got her numb uh, previously with some Comfortox syringes, lidocaine 2%. This is the this is where the rubbery meets the road, folks. Uh, you've got to be on the right exact plane right here. And once you start here, the rest of it goes fairly easy, 18 gauge. Uh, a pilot hole needle, as you know, and now we introduce the Comfortox micro cannula, and this is the best micro cannula by far. Why? The other ones will dive on you. You don't know where the tip of your instrument is. It won't maintain the plane. This one will every single time. Now we know where exactly where we want to be, and retrograde injection of just a little bit of lidocaine. Don't flood the tissue. We absolutely do not want to flood the tissue here. Just a little bit to make sure that patient is nice and nice. Numb, and now we introduce the VSoft lift. This is a 19 gauge by a 90 or 100 millimeter. Take your pick. Curtain over the curtain rod, get it to place, and make sure you're exactly where you want to be. Bunch up the tissue like this to get around the curve, sometimes of that cheek, and we'll teach you all this in live patient certification training by the AAFE here, and now we're exactly where we want to be. You are going to exaggerate the tissue, pull it straight back, click, click, click. You'll feel all of that engage really, really nicely, and now you have done just a beautiful lift on that upper face down to the oral commissure, down to the jowls, and you are going to pull on that, and look at that beautiful result. Just two threads in this treatment here uh, on this patient on this day, and this is really, really incredible. Now, you pull them back, and you push down against the tissue safely with the scissors. You're going to snip it. Look at that little bunching there. You are going to rub that out, and really, and that's the end of that thread is going to disappear underneath the skin, as you are going to see uh, right now here. But that is what it looks like. Smooth everything out. You're still going to feel it engaging the tissue, and that's going to smooth that entry point 
just really, really nicely. Watch it just disappear, that bunching. And that is the strength of the AFI protocols and techniques, comfort and strength, and the VSOF lift lifting threads. Look at that gorgeous jawline. That's just two threads. Now, I want you to compare this to any other system or technique or PDO threads out there that would take six to eight to ten threads on this side to do the exact same thing and that is a beautiful result with just those two threads right there um and that's the difference and that's why v soft lift is what is exclusively used in a fee live patient certification training so make sure you get AV certification trained because you can deliver this for your patients. You've got to add lifting PDO threads to your practice. Now, look at these gorgeous before and afters. And here you see the side that was treated here as it lifts everything else. Patient looks like a different patient completely there. Now we go back with botulinum toxin, with dermal fillers. Certainly there are areas that we can go ahead and fill up with these things. By the way, this patient's first treatment um, and with injectables, and she is absolutely thrilled. It took years off of her face, and now you see a uh, straight on uh, before and after face. Certainly we did the other side, and, uh, and we treated her the way she needed to be treated, but there are lots of other treatments we can add on to this but always do lifting PDO threads start then you go back with fillers botulinum toxin you can do at any time smooth PDO threads you can certainly do for more collagen production um, and add on but this is a great treatment it's time for you to add a lifting PDO threads to your practice right now and it's time for you to get AFI certification trained today we can't wait to teach you this at an upcoming course and there is that patient. And yeah, that is what's really, really interesting is that this patient came in just for lifting PDO threads. She never had bot botulinum toxin before, never had dermal fillers before. She came in this as the first service that she had because she had seen, I guess, some of our social media in the AFE or whatever. And uh, that's a big improvement with a minimal amount of threads. And again, that's why we use what we use. And if this was any other PDO thread, you know that they would be using 1020 on each side of her face. For that, that should tell you something about their strength. Another patient, again, this was a minimal amount of threads. I think uh, three vectors from the cheek down and one or two threads uh, to snatch back that jawline. Then some smooth thre smooth PDO threads. Again, this is another V-soft lift case. Underneath to get rid of that little chin pooch. And you can permanently remove fat just like you can with Kybella here. But to wrap up this, again, going back to the study that we started with here, do fillers lift? And again, dermal fillers, hyaluronic acid dermal fillers, you decide. Yes and no. Again, if you consider one millimeter or less a clinically relevant lift, then they lift. And they do lift. I mean, the evidence shows that they lift. But no question, there is something a lot better that, that will give a real lift uh, for all of that. And that will typically last anywhere from 12 to 24 months, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter. They also produce collagen, uh, PDO threads. And again, I would only use FDA cleared class 2 with proper packaging PDO threads. Uh, but you're the clinician. You've got to make your own choices there. So let's let's we we start to finish up and then we've got had a lot of questions about training. So I'll just give you a little bit of that. But let's let's finish up where we started. And that is none of this is gospel. You're ultimately the clinician. You've got to make critical treatment decisions for your patients and you've got to balance the evidence base. It's not gospel. Clinical experience is not gospel. There's lots of different studies where you may want to change your technique there just a little bit for all of that. What evidence-based is, is it's great information that has been tested, but how you synthesize and use that information is up to you. And again, we can't we, we can't, you know, idolize some of this and just take the headlines from some of these uh, studies. For example, as I talked about before, uh, for example, dermal fillers lift the tissue. Yes, but, you know, how so? Or um, 
or you know 27 or 30 gauge uh, cannulas are as sharp as a needle that's true for one cannula right because you, they didn't test anything more than one cannula so we got to stop taking the headlines we've got to really understand what we're talking about when you talk about an evidence-based study what how your clinical experience gets into this as well and then critically think through this thing you know a lot unfortunately there's there's, you know, there's, I mean, the, the easy way out and the lazy way out is to kind of just be a sheep and say, okay, yeah, that's what the evidence says. I'm just going to go ahead and do this. Then next week, another piece of evidence comes out that, you know, okay, now I'm doing that. They typically make the worst injectors because you keep changing and not giving yourself and and an, the the you know, the confidence in what you're in in real treatment and evaluating what you're doing. So you really need all of these things when you get to treatment decisions. There, so it's not the you know again when you get to some of these uh, let's call them contests and there are lots of them. I'm not picking out anybody specifically, although you know uh, uh, you know sometimes uh, people think that I'm only talking about them. I'm not not. there's lots of this this goes on in the injector community online all the time as it does in, in the world community online especially when you get the politics and all other kinds of nonsense out there uh you know put people in the box oh they're just voicing an opinion they don't know anything about research no there's probably research now, they, everyone's pretty responsible uh you know you've got to take people and give them a little bit of credit for that oh you know he's just a researcher he doesn't inject patients let's give them a little bit more credit than that as they do see a lot of patients at least in the valuation and really understand the anatomy we've got to put all of that together right and you know i mean again i, I saw you know a um a great researcher again i won't mention names here uh but you know people were were complaining about some of her research that you know it's not relevant and that's fine we can we can go ahead and and question people's research and, and i certainly you know uh, talked about some of the things that we see that we've seen in the research and we do that all the time you know we've got to stop getting into these contests and have a discussion that's what moves this the entire injectable world, facial aesthetics, uh, the medical aesthetic community forward is really questioning each other for sure and not saying, oh, you're wrong, this is the only truth. That's baloney. And I, I think most reasonable injectors really know that that's baloney. There's so much we can learn from each other. Every piece of evidence is just a tool. Every piece of clinical experience is a tool. You hear people speak all the time, giving their opinions or a clinical experience. You know what? Take it for what it's worth. Evaluate it. Critically think it through, and you will come up with the best treatment decisions that are out there uh, for that. AV draining. Let's go, just go ahead and tell you if you're interested all of our cme certification trainings level one foundational botulinum toxin and fillers level two uh, advanced level three master uh master nose master lips master eyes lifting pdo threads different levels smooth pdo threads virtual or live patient training ultrasound imaging and certainly injector cadaver anatomy training is fantastic you can see it all at afetraining.com we're at over 50 locations throughout the U.S. Uh, constantly with four or five uh, courses every single week at least. Um, so there's lots of opportunity to, to uh, learn. I don't want to forget about TMJ, oral facial pain, trigger point therapy training, lots that the AFE can offer you. We're happy to help. And lots of resources that we have. And here again is some of the resources that we talked about before. Uh, my email, if you like, uh, AFE's email, afetraining.com for always the best tuition specials that the AFE has. AFE Virtual is the only smooth PDO thread. If you want to learn smooth PDO threads, which we didn't show, they are so fantastic for collagen biostimulation and do an amazing job uh, for slow building of collagen, cheek fill, rejuvenation of the skin. And the AFI has the only solid filler uh, smooth PDO thread CME certification course. It's eight CMEs. You can see it at afivirtual.com, afiultrasound.com. We've got three different ways for you to learn ultrasound. One is completely on demand, and you don't need an ultrasound to go ahead and take this course. Uh, StatDDS has the entire Comfort Tax line that we mentioned, VSoft Lift. In our opinion, best PDO threads, FDA clear class two with proper packaging that's essential and also it's the strongest and produces the most collagen wave take a look at the wave fe it is 
fantastic, finally an affordable ultrasound for every aesthetic practice and apwebinars.com where we give lots of webinars uh, so you can always check that out. So thank you so much for being part of this program. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. Continued success to all of you and we will talk to you all again real soon.